Hi, this is Catherine M. Davis with Art Beat Santa Fe, and I am here with Mocha Lage, whose show is installed around us at David Richard Gallery. The title of the show is In Shape, In Color. I think that might be, um, that might go without saying about why that is, but I want to get further into it and not be um, too facetious or, or flippant, um, despite the fact that we are using Dave Hickey as our inspiration for this interview. Are we? <laughs> <laughs> Dave, salute. Um, if there are people who do not know who you are, Mocha, I wanted just to read from this um, catalog um, from Dallas, um, Color Into Space. It says that you spent four years as a studio assistant to Gene Davis, the important Washington color school painter, best known for his paintings of vertical stripes. Um, let's start there because one of the things that Dave Hickey did say when he was in conversation here at David Richard Gallery earlier in the month, he was in conversation with painter Tim Babington. He said, art changes but doesn't look different. And I thought that was a really interesting comment. I took it to mean, um, if I can understand Dave Hickey at all, that, um, that art may look similar to the art that has gone before. For example, these are um, perhaps a little elegiac uh, to um, Ellsworth Kelly, as well as the whole Washington color school. But, um, they have entirely different meanings, different processes, I'm assuming. So I wanted you to talk about that, the influence of the Washington Color School, working with Gene Davis, <clears throat> and how you've developed since. since. Mm -hmm. uh, well, the four years that I spent with Gene Davis were, uh, when I was in art school, I was very young, and uh, it was a uh, a world that opened up to me in terms of the Washington Color School uh, as a whole because a number of those people were teaching at the Corcoran. Um, but what really um, made the Color School was uh, the, Kenneth Nolan who had brought mm -hmm. uh, Clement Greenberg down to Washington to uh, take a look at Morris Lewis's work. and. Um, and one of the reasons that Greenberg um, loved the color school was that it matched his idea of what modern uh, painting should be, which is to say uh, total pictorial flatness. Absolutely. I was actually thinking about that, believe it or not. I was thinking, what would Clement Greenberg think of your version of um, uh, coming out of the school, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, Gene Davis and the Washington Colorists? I don't well, I'm sure he would have a fit. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> and that's you know, well, fine. Well, plus you're a woman, so well, I mean, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, the, if there's anything that uh, dovetails in the Washington Color School with my work, um, it, it could be some technical work in terms of uh, stained canvas, stained raw canvas. Um, but I deliberately left this purely formalistic mm -hmm. um, realm, which um, you know, did not accept any kind of illusionism or content right. or, um, and, and I think Narrative, part of, nothing. yeah, the, the part of the illusion, I think, um, in a Greenbergian sense, has to do with figuration, which I, I don't agree with that premise either, but um, the, um, and the shape canvas was also uh, being made by some uh, of mm -hmm. the members of the color school, like Tom Downing, mm -hmm. um, but never with this element, um, the, the three-dimensional uh, right. aspect on a two-dimensional plane, and the uh, integration of the shape within the color, and mm -hmm. the, the, the equal weight of mm -hmm. uh, one and the other. I mean, there are a lot of various elements that I telescope in these paintings which uh, and we'll get know. into some mm -hmm. of those but definitely I think with the hinged aspect of something mm -hmm. opening and or closing um, the dimensionality is such a vital part of your work that I just was thinking old Clement just would not agree with this yeah 
But oh. interestingly mm -hmm. enough, um, your work does come out of the Washington Color School. But let's also talk about, um, you alerted me to, to a movement I'm, I wasn't familiar with by the name, MADI, M-A-D-I. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that. And um, the second you go to look anything up about MADI and look at MOCA's work, it's like, oh yeah, that makes mm -hmm. sense. Mm -hmm. Well, MADI is an interesting movement because it's uh, probably the only uh, continuously running art movement right. um, since the 40s. And it was launched by a, um, an artist from Uruguay by the name of Carmelo Arden Quinn, um, who uh, left Uruguay to go to Buenos Aires, which was a, a major art capital at the time, and there um, met a number of artists who were working in this stuff. MADI is an acronym. I mean, there are different uh, versions of, the, of what the acronym stands for. Uh, some have said that it's uh, uh, dialectical materialism, which uh, reversed in Spanish, um, mm -hmm. you know, would give Mari. Um, but the um, most agreed upon uh, version is um, movement, abstraction, dimension, invention. Uh, let's see, Mari, abstraction, mm -hmm. dimension, invention. Mm -hmm. Um, and the and shaped canvases. Right. So that's, that's the that's the dimension uh, uh -huh. part because. None of these, uh, the works that fit in the Mahdi aesthetic are um, square or rectangular or have any kind of uh, easel, traditional easel shape. Um, That's an interesting point. In, in yeah. that sense. Um, the, the, the dimension oftentimes because they're superimposed, um, there's, there's dimensionality, 3D, it could be physical or implied. Um, and invention, uh, and, and Ultimately, what happened is Carmelo went to Paris and found a lot of resonance with some of the artists who were working in neoplasticism. Mm -hmm. um, and the, in fact, the, the head of the international Mahdi movement was a French artist whom I'm just curating a show for in the Mahdi Museum wow. um, opening next month. Um, so is that in Buenos uh, Aires? Uh, no, it's in Dallas, in the oh. Oh. Mahdi Museum. There we are. Right there. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, cool. Yeah. Uh, so very interesting. Uh, and uh, today, there are many Mahdi artists working in Italy, in Hungary, in Brazil, mm -hmm. um, and it never really took off in the United States. And I would say partially because it was not an artist, uh, an American artist, uh, or American movement uh, at the base. Um, not a U.S. movement, but American right. in the sense that it comes right. from the Americas. Did well, it originate US. in South America? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Argentina, yeah. yeah, Buenos Aires. So, but there was no um, in the U.S. In other words, there was really no. Um, uh, it, it never got any traction. Right. Um, now, tell us where you think that um, Ellsworth Kelly fits into the the two areas, because I think anyone who's looking at your work possibly for the first time is going to be wondering about um, any similarities. Again, this idea that art can look similar but be completely different in terms of what it's about. Um, well, Ellsworth Kelly, I would say, belongs to the color field mm -hmm. um, area and I can certainly uh, see how my work um, deals with that. But again, I, I like this idea of uh, the telescoping of ideas because many of these artists are treating one particular aesthetic and, and I'm really trying to uh, reference a number of art historical movements, right. of right. art historical influences, and subsume them into my own particular mm -hmm. uh, interpretation of that. Um, so uh, Ellsworth Kelly, um, I would for me um, maybe overlaps Rothko a bit in in mm -hmm. the term of um, in this large expansive uh, color, of the, of the, color. The, which which radiates and um, right. 
I was going to use the word aura. <laughs> which Did you see I have a note there? <laughs> yeah, We're going to talk about Walter okay. Benjamin's theory of aura. Well, maybe we should, yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, I, I was hoping to, at least at yeah. some point. But I wanted to, um, you've suggested that you um, have been very influenced. You're not strictly coming out of one school or another or even two um, that you've worked in, but you have a lot of considerations that, again, Clement Greenberg would probably be horrified because um, you're referencing, um, I think, your biography, you're referencing um, <coughs> land, and um, if not directly landscape, then certainly the light as it falls upon a land that's inhabited by people. Um, it's no coincidence that you grew up in North Africa and um, found yourself here in New Mexico. Um, so light is obviously um, a clear influence on you. Um, but I'm also interested in, in um, um, you've mentioned Tessera, um, the ideas of mosaics, uh, tiles mm -hmm. that come from Northern Africa. Um, I know that you have often mixed your own colors. Um, tell us about some of these aspects of your work. Um, yeah. Uh, so growing up in North Africa um, was um, magical, I would say. Um, although the political climate there was, was not ideal, um, the tell us about the tell the, the audience about um, your experience mm -hmm. as a little child, looking from a child's eye view what what the world looked like to mm -hmm. you. Yeah, and <laughs> there are a lot of uh, rushing memories here, um, but there's a, I, I just want to preface this um, by mentioning um, a French artist by the name of Michel Pastoreau because he he wrote uh, a number of wonderful books. He's a medievalist. And he wrote one in particular called The Colors of Our Childhood. Mm. And he, he posits that, in fact, the colors that we're exposed to in our childhood are the ones that we always return to, that, mm. that we're imbued, mm -hmm. we're impregnated with these colors. And, mm -hmm. and I would say that certainly in this case, you know, it applies to me. I've always um, yeah. I've gravitated towards Mediterranean colors, this, this golden light of the desert. Um, and there's something about, um, you know, yes, as a child, um, because I was displaced from uh, North Africa fairly young, um, a lot of my memories were of, of, a, of a little child being close to the ground and, and being um, constantly uh, exposed to these, these reds and ochres and, uh, and tans and the textures. Um, so they're, they're colors that just come back in, in my work. Mm -hmm. Um, not even in, in a conscious way. Um, but there's something about the desert um, also which uh, I think ultimately uh, was perhaps the largest influence in my work now um, because it is so um, filled with illusion and mirage and mm -hmm. um, uncertainty. Um, and, and I would say that the, the kind of um, aesthetic displacement that occurs in the work is directly um, a, an outgrowth of this, this maybe geographical displacement that, mm -hmm. that you know, I lived through in the desert and stayed with me. You brought up in, in the notes that we exchanged um, before this talk, you brought up the idea of um, wanting to, as a talking point, wanting to uh, look into perception versus sensation. Why don't you go ahead mm -hmm. and start talking about that now? Mm -hmm. Because it has to do with illusion, it has to do with um, opticality and all kinds of things. Yeah, the, um, again, a lot of the ideas that I'm interested in um, have to do with binary oppositions, which are not opposites necessarily, mm -hmm. but are two, two sides of the same coin, right. you know, to, to, to know dark, you need to know light, and, right. and so forth. And so, um, the, the perception and the sensation to me are exactly that, um, a, a binary one of many, but the, the perception being um, how we interpret information more in a, in, in a, 
in terms of knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, whereas the sensation is, is literally something that we apprehend through the senses, something right. that, that is more emotional. So these two um, factors are always in balance. Um, mm -hmm. and when you look at one of the paintings, you, you are, um, your mind is called upon to try to figure out what this is, intellectually perhaps, and because there is no solution, there is no solving right. this, this puzzle, um, uh, then you know, my hope is at least that the, the, just the pure sensation, the emotion of the, of the color is, is ultimately allows you to leave that uh, you know, more perceptual side mm -hmm. and go to the sensational side, sensation. Well, it seems that now would be a good time for you to discuss your process. Um, uh, when Dave Hickey was here in conversation with Tim Babington, Tim said, you can do things with paint that you can't experience anywhere else. And he was referencing how we um, view so many art images as digital images online um, rather than in person and certainly not painting them ourselves. So I wanted to, um, I'm sure that the painters in the audience would love to hear from you about how this process works for you. Um, the, the process, the actual process of painting and the... Uh, yeah. Where um, you start. How you well, also, there's the, the idea, it was also Tim who said the ability to make something you can leave alone mm -hmm. is very hard. Mm -hmm. And he was suggesting that you try and get in there within 98% of it's being done and, and back off then. Um, well, with regards to his first comment in, uh, in terms of um, painting being uh, the way, the, you know, the effect that you can um, arrive at um, and with no other way, um, maybe it ties into the experience of the, of the uniqueness of the piece mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to the digital. Uh, mm -hmm. Reproduction and here, I'm sorry, Benjamin keeps coming. There's <laughs> Walter Benjamin. Yes. But, uh, um, um, as far as knowing when a painting is finished, uh, that's something that takes or has taken me a long time to get to, and and it has to do for you know, again in my process. Um, being in a dialogue with the work to the point where you're no longer um, imposing your your idea of what would be you know this will be good for you, you know? <laughs> it's kind of the, you're like this. It's a, the overarching parent there um, and and there does come a time where um, something in you says no no I, you know needs a little more and and some another part of you says you know back off mm -hmm. so and it's and it's a it's a place it's a feeling that you come to and you have to respect um, and you get better at it I think um, mm -hmm. so it, but it is an ongoing dialogue with the work um, tell us how you how you start um, do you start with a shape in mind? Do you start with a color in mind? Do you begin? You sketch. Mm -hmm. um, so tell us about mm -hmm. how that process brings you to um, these shaped canvases. Yeah, I've sketched um, almost all my life. It, and um, this was something that was very um, strongly imprinted upon us at the Corcoran. Um, mm -hmm. Keep a journal and sketch. So. Uh, I don't even question it. I try to do it first thing in the morning. It's uh -huh. it's really critical because I, I feel that those that's the best hours of the day. You know, you're, you're, uh, the world is just opening like a flower. Um, so I want to capture that. Um, and and as a result, I have many 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 sketchbooks. So those to me are like a library of ideas. Mm -hmm. if, if if I'm ever um, you know questioning what's coming next. Um, and there's, there's a quote that I remember Jean Davis said um, about um, you, know, you have to know how to raid your past. And mm -hmm. he would do it all the time, mm -hmm. um, you know, several, you know, maybe ten years later, maybe two years later. Um, so those, those are some of the ideas and then, of course, the, 
more of the, the environmental ideas. But I will sketch, um, and usually there, there are many small sketches. I do a lot of them, they're like writing. And, um, uh, and then there'll be a, a sketch that, it, that gets my attention. Um, it's, it's a little bit like uh, what Richard Serra said, uh, find an idea with a future. Um, mm. And so when I find a sketch that has, in my mind, a future, then I develop it further and um, uh, to the point where I can commit to making a stretcher and, mm -hmm. um, and uh, making a piece. Mm -hmm. um, Do you make your own stretchers? I work with a fabricator now. I did for years, and uh, it's uh, you know, with the, the amount of pieces that um, I'm producing. Yeah, we work together. But it, it, a lot of the pieces are predicated on the grid, so um, they can be scaled, and they can um, you know, they're, they're fairly uh, straightforward. Yeah. How about um, I'm thinking about the golden means. Um, what are some of the, um, you had also mentioned in your notes for talking points, um, some of the authors and the art movements that have been an influence on you. And um, Mocha makes my job so easy because you're so intelligent that all I have to do is basically say one word and she's fun to listen to. <laughs> yeah, no, so just give us a few ideas of what what has influenced you? Yeah, what do you think um, about? well, I, I was, uh, I grew up in the French system, so we, uh, it was heavy on uh, literature and philosophy in, in high school. Um, and, but there's one philosopher in particular that I would say has followed me, or I followed rather, um, throughout my art career, and that's uh, Gaston Bachelard. Mm -hmm. um, and, and Bachelard it was particularly relevant for this series because he wrote a, a book called The Poetics of Space mm -hmm. in which he um, challenges architects to uh, not to look at space as an aesthetic uh, environment or even a functional environment but as an emotional place uh, where people are actually living and, and experiencing things. Um, uh, and, and he uh, runs the entire gamut of the, the emotion of architecture, but also of nests, of, of anything that is mm -hmm. spatial. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, there's um, Merleau-Ponty, uh, who uh, wrote the Phenomenology of Perception. And th in uh, that sense, the, um, the experience of the body uh, and the mind uh, in other words, the, the physical experience of the work of art. The sensation. Um, again, the sensation, um, which really was a, a wonderful uh, segue away from uh, Descartes, because we, much of our education was very Cartesian <laughs> in that sense. Uh, um, as far as um, art movements, uh, pretty much uh, the, the gamut of, of art history, uh, I, I've like to think that um, my work is art historically referenced. Um, I don't think you can make um, truly uh, unique work unless you've <laughs> digested a lot of this right, uh, right. Uh, without repeating a lot of what's already been said uh, or done. And of course, uh, Distill uh, was a strong influence, and I would say, yeah, in particular, because, um, and recently I, I um, had the uh, good fortune of seeing the retrospective of Van Doesburg at the Guggenheim, and, um, and Distill is very interesting because uh, Theo Van Doesburg founded Distill as a magazine and, and ultimately as a movement. And uh, Mondrian was called in to write the manifesto of sorts. And, and the two of them came together uh, and, and started butting heads because Mondrian was saying, well, Distill is uh, really a movement about uh, rectilinearity, uh, verticals and horizontals. And, and, and Dosberg said, well, what about the diagonal? 
Mm -hmm. And uh, my mom says, you know, the diagonal is, you know, taboo. There's, you know, there's no place for this. And they literally had a falling out mm -hmm. because of the direction of a line. And so <laughs> I, you know, <laughs> am definitely more of a Van Doesburg uh, uh, fan in that sense because uh, it, it, it has to do with the, the dynamism. And, and a lot of yeah, my work absolutely. is, is uh, I mean, the diagonals are all over. Oh. Right. You, I can't imagine your work without the diagonal. No. Um, mm -hmm. it, it, I, no, that's not a good thought for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, Dave Hickey also said at this last talk that we attended here at the at David Richard Gallery that the relationship between a work of art and the beholder is very delicate. I agree with that. That's rather en enigmatic. But how do you respond to that? How do you experience that? Yeah, it, it is a bit enigmatic. I mean, you could take it any number of ways. But um, I think that uh, as an artist, when you create work, you are asking a lot of the beholder. And mm -hmm. um, so my sense is you better have something to give them to hold their, their attention. I mean, uh, and to uh, allow them to experience something um, either sublime or, uh, or, or to think about or, or to get angry about it was something to, to mm -hmm. uh, allow them to uh, move from that experience. Um, I'm aware of the fact that many of these works are somewhat demanding too of the, uh, the beholder because the, Again, you're, you're having to, to try and figure out what is going on, and yeah. there's, there's a lot of ambiguity. Um, and a certain kind mm -hmm. of denial, too. It's as if the painting is saying, you shall not pass, mm -hmm. but at the same time it's mm -hmm. saying, come in, mm -hmm. come, mm -hmm. come look. Yeah, and that goes back to the, uh, the, the ambiguity, this, this, right. the perceptual ambiguity, and the... Um, but I also... Uh, hope that the, the beholder is enjoying the displacement of sorts, mm -hmm. that, that it's something that they don't necessarily experience, uh, and that, that it brings a, um, you know, ah, 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 in a, in a modest way. <laughs> <laughs> you don't need to be modest. I, at this point, it seemed that it would be quite relevant to ask if anyone in the audience would like to um, describe a response that they've had to, um, especially the works here um, in this exhibition by MOCA. Um, I'm sure I, I see you all and I know you all as very intelligent, um, well-versed people. I'd love to hear your reactions to that, about that relationship between the work of art and, um, and yourself as the beholder. Now, most of you are also painters, so um, that's going to add a dimension to this dimensional work. I um, was thinking they were three-dimensional when I was sitting here because you used the illusion of bending and mm -hmm. shadowing. And I just asked Tom, are these flat? <laughs> yeah. And he knew the answer. But, uh, <laughs> no, that, that is another element that struck me as I was sort of puzzled, actually, because you have um, created bends and shadows and illusion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the... Uh, in the process of making the, the pieces, and I would say in a sketching phase of them, uh, while I never think about the color, I always think about a light source. Oh. Hmm. So they're, they're just black and white lines, but I'm always imagining a light source. And um, I will often create the light and skew it so that it's not a possible light. Mm -hmm. that, so there again, the, the ambiguity uh, occurs. Um, you see it's something in three-dimensional, but it, it doesn't fit. Cezanne-like in that sense, that you cannot observe the table 
down here and up here mm -hmm. at the mm -hmm. same time. But if we're uh, willing to accept movement in time, mm -hmm. then it all kind of starts to make a little bit of sense. And that's another art historical reference that probably on um, first glimpse of your work, um, people might not think of. Mm. Yeah. Well, I, I think instability is a very creative uh, place to uh -huh. be. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Oh, um. You also had made a note about the unreliability, perceptive, mm -hmm. uh, the unreliability of perception. Mm -hmm. Well, our senses are extremely unreliable, so why try to make something reliable? <laughs> right. <laughs> um, and perhaps that goes back to the desert as well. Uh, and and it, I mean, everything around us. Um, I've worked a lot with perspective, and if you take something simple such as uh, two railroad tracks go in the distance, they meet at a point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is what our eyes tell us. Um, and Albers looked at, at that whole phenomenon with the interaction of color, and mm -hmm. you know, what happens if you put uh, the same color on two different backgrounds. Uh, so we're, we're constantly bombarded with uh, unreliability in, through our senses. And I was interested in pushing that a, a little more in, a, in an aesthetic place. And you know, going back to the desert uh, again, I, I think uh, because I've been a nomad all my life. I've, I've been, I've lived in many countries. I've um, been exposed to many, many cultures, um, and I, I'm comfortable with, with um, um, unreliability or, 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 the or un unpredictability, maybe. Uh -huh. In that sense, or shifting. Um, yeah. So you have developed an eye and a, a sensibility for that. I wanted to ask you something um, along the lines of: Are these flat or not? Um, I, when you mentioned Albers, now we're looking at something that the the cameras aren't going to catch, but this piece um, over here has two um, blues. They look very different to me. Are they? Yes. They are. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was a, a conscious decision because of the uh, the shape that the scene was in front. I could have m made them the same, and there would have been uh, a, a different a, a similar. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. But it, it, I knew that uh, difference would be there, and I accentuated it in that piece. And that again seems to go back to skewing the light source mm -hmm. yeah. in a really interesting way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And many of these, um, for instance, the overlaps on uh, this piece where the yellow comes onto the gray, the overlap or the translucent part of it is not the product of that yellow and that gray. It's a completely different color, um, but that creates that floating uh, impression. Mm -hmm. So there, there are a number of techniques that I use in, uh, to move things away from the, uh, the predictable. Right. And you also use flash. Is yes. there a reason why you do that? Um, I use flash because uh, it is highly saturated and matte. And for these pieces, um, I want the least amount of reflectivity um, so that not only you're absorbed in the perspective and the dimensionality of it, but um, the, the surface of it, um, there, there's absolutely nothing to keep you from you know, plunging into to that. And mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know, many of you might have had this, these experiences a, as a kid, but I, I used to, um, when my father was driving, I used to, to look back on the, on the back dash on the back seat and look at the sky, and at some point, the whole perspective would reverse, and I thought that I was falling mm -hmm. into the sky, mm -hmm. and and I would get such a kick out of that vertigo. That, you know, um, so it was maybe a little bit of that. Mm -hmm. Any other um, reactions of viewers to um, Mocha's work, John? Well, the question I would ask is: when when you draw or when you sketch, do you typically do that in color? Or do you mostly do that in uh, line drawings, black and white? I it's all that. black and white. It's yeah. all line. I never use color. Yeah. No. And the color decisions that come in, like when you're in the process of painting, uh, the, the shaped canvases are made, or? You, yeah. The the yeah. color is um, because there's so much preparatory work 
that it is very involved in, in getting to the point where I can paint. Mm -hmm. The actual painting is a total unknown for me. I have no idea what color mm -hmm. I'm going to use. I have no idea what the piece is going to look like. And um, I, there again, there is a, a dialogue that goes on with the work. And uh, you may think that uh, a certain color should go in a certain place, but if you really are listening to that dialogue, it, it uh, so I've just stopped, you know, guessing what color should go where. I just go with it, and um, the, the, I will start with the color. I do a lot of swatches because there, there's color shifting when they dry and so forth. Um, and I want to make sure I have a color in my in my mind. I'm, I'm very uh, you know when it comes up, it's it's very clear, and so then I have to make it um, to mix it. Um, then it goes on, and the one after that, I have no idea what it's going to be <laughs> either. And it's not necessarily a question of adjacency. I mean, they, they can be I know, away from each other. So that's the way I proceed. Yes. And just to follow up, um, just to make sure I understand, so you, you make the canvas first, but you have the basic design within the canvas in, you know, sketch form before you form the canvases? Mm -hmm. And deeply considering line, and, or excuse me, light mm -hmm. in that equation as mm -hmm. part of your question. Yeah. The, well, the canvases, uh, once they're made, um, yes, they, as you see, the internal shapes are directly linked to the external uh, edges. So uh, there may be times where I change that. Uh, it's very difficult to do that uh, because, uh, <laughs> uh, it, it, again, it's a commitment in terms of the, the shape. And um, so, yes, I, it is basically a blow up of the the sketch that I've made, that I've committed to building and then to uh, painting. Right. So then in most cases you have the, uh, the, the shapes of internally have also affected the mm -hmm. outer shape, so then you're considering color at that point. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and as I say, some of the internal shapes could, can change. It, it has happened. Um, generally they, they are pretty determined. Um, but the color is, yeah. Um, um, completely intuitive. Would you say that your process of sketching first thing in the morning is very similar to um, Julia Cameron's uh, morning pages for writers and artists, actually? Um, yeah, I, I don't uh, look at it as a journal per se in, in that sense. Um, and I may want to go for a walk instead of sketching, mm -hmm. so I'm, I'm not really rigid about it, but okay. I, I have just found that those early hours are very productive. Well, especially if you're um, considering light, which mm -hmm. is, uh, given your background, given your history, and if it is indeed true that we um, are drawn back to the colors, which are made of light, that we first experience when we're very young, um, you're going to be up at dawn mm -hmm. and experiencing light. <laughs> not really. <laughs> I was hoping somebody would be, because I'm not. <laughs> well, I, no, I'm actually more of a, uh, of a sunset uh, person okay. I mean, in, in terms of... But no, I, I will see uh, dawn colors. Uh, and the funny thing about colors is, there again, it's another example of illusion. Because right. it, it, none of those really exist. They're wavelengths. It's it's electromagnetic, uh, you know. Right, right. That that, that imprint on our brain. So, um, and each one of us has a different experience of of color. Um, um, I wanted to ask you something that might sound silly, but what the heck? Um, what if we took black away from you? I mean, it looks, mm -hmm. on the f surface, it looks as if, well, she'll be fine. But I just wanted to ask you that. Yeah, no, there are a few without blacks. <laughs> <laughs> no, I realize that. I see that. But how, um, that, how important is yeah. black to you? And what yeah. if 
What if it were taken from your vocabulary? Would it be like trying to make sentences without using the word the, or without using verbs, or? Oh, I've run out of black in the studio and you know, used, used other, no, oh. used other colors. I, because the, the black is, uh, um, it's a dark protagonist. Uh, what a lovely so term. It, it, it could be, um, could be a, a dark blue. It could be a dark. In okay. fact, you know, I wouldn't say that I go as far as I Reinhardt, but I th there are other colors in that black that you, you don't right. necessarily right. see. Um, and you know, I, I'm not mixing uh, all of my colors to get the black. But uh, th there's something about um, black, pure black, and, and the depth of black uh, that interests me in terms of a, of a passage. Of a, and of a shadow of, of materializing something that's immaterial. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, no, I mean, you could probably take away half of my colors. I would still figure out a way to. <laughs> you know, You're not going to make stop. a tease. No, no, it's uh, yeah, it, it's it's about the light and dark, and about the brilliance uh, and. Uh, but we have so many experiences in our life that, that you know, we can go back to any, I mean, colors are like experience. So you take a few away and there's still plenty there. Mm -hmm. Well, talking about how we take in the paintings, the thing that I, I that always, that strikes me is the kind of, um, kind of confident, recklessness. Mm. As a, from painter to painter, I think we talked about this a little bit at the opening, that I sort of see as playful and humorous and, and reckless in a good way. It's like you've got all these logical kind of premises, but I see that you've kind of abandoned them and let the painting, you know, play. And, I, and that's what I really like about mm -hmm. this work. Well, because uh, it, it yeah. keeps, you know, not, you know, somebody said they contradict themselves or something, but there, there's really a lot going on in there as a dialogue that mm -hmm. I appreciate. And I'm glad you brought that up because um, we, we didn't finish the, the conversation on Mahdi, but the, the one of the, the overarching qualities of Mahdi is playfulness, and which is right. probably one of the that. reasons that, that with all these serious uh, <laughs> painters in the 50s, you know, it was not appropriate to, <laughs> to bring about. That's why it wasn't big in the U.S. <laughs> <laughs> um, but this notion of playfulness is, I think, very important. Uh, if you look at the way we grow up and kids, uh, play is an extremely important part of development, communication, um, and creativity. There, there are all kinds of things you can do with play that are not allowed in other mm -hmm. contexts. Mm -hmm. So you're right. The play is, is uh, an important element in these works. And yet that's not a concept that, that springs out to me when I look. Mm -hmm. My experience of these is uh, I'm, I feel that I'm looking at a courageous act. Now, I don't mean to valorize that. I don't mean to heroize the, the experience, but um, there is something so precise and at the same time so spontaneous um, that I wonder at your courage in saying, okay, this is, just, this is going right here. Here's the line, here's the color. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's like the confidence that I, the right. that I would use, but I think right. it's kind of the same idea, which makes them very sophisticated paintings mm -hmm. that painters love. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, my, my other question would be, um, what about Elizabeth Murray? And, and I don't mean that just because they're shaped, but I mean because of the sort of explosive, mm -hmm. um, Ra almost raucousness of the mm -hmm. work, mm -hmm. which again I like. Mm -hmm. uh, that's they're almost pop in a way, you know. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's the Modi counter balance. Maybe that was going on. I don't know. But at whatever about mm -hmm. that. But what about Elizabeth Murray? Um, I would say I, I have a similar reaction to um, some of her large uh, wall pieces as I do to the the later uh, Stella pieces. 
Mm. Um, and seeing the retrospective, uh, Stella's retrospective a few days, uh, when was it, at the uh, Whitney, uh, like a year ago, um, I was very drawn to the work that he was doing in the 70s, uh, which maybe you know, was closer to this and less so to the, 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 the more raucous. Oh, his uh, metal stuff. Yeah, yeah well, mm -hmm. even pre-metal, um, mm -hmm. things that were maybe were closer to what Elizabeth Murray mm -hmm. was doing. Uh, it's, uh, it's not an aesthetic that I espouse, mm -hmm. in a sense. Uh, uh, I, I can I respect it I, I appreciate it and and um, I it, I just couldn't imagine working in that way. Right. Yeah. Good question. Mm -hmm. I, yes. I think more of Dorothy or Rockburn. Yeah. 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 Dorothy Rockburn. Uh, Folding. Definitely, and, and her experimenting with uh, materials, different, uh, um, she, she worked with uh, uh, unrefined uh, or petrol and all kinds of, mm -hmm. of, of but in very, in, in, but her use of an investigation of space in very small pieces uh, look almost monumental, they're, they're, they're quite lovely, yeah. What Ron Davis house did you have oh. any conversations with him? I have not. I'd love to. Um, but certainly uh, he's wor been working with uh, similar uh, 3D implications in on a 2D plane um, and color. Um, I, I've always enjoyed his work. Um, I don't know how much shape canvas he's doing. Oh, uh, really, earlier he did some. Some of the early so ones, much. yeah. I was thinking when I was thinking of Carmen Herrera. Yeah, right? yeah. But, but you know, you she's more. You get more complex, where she mm -hmm. strips away completely. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. But yeah. color-wise, the, yeah. the kind of something yeah. about uh, different than the male. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. And it's subtle. I don't think I can put words to it, but it's just mm -hmm. a visual. Mm -hmm. Like when you're thinking of Stella or mm -hmm. Ellsworth Kelly, mm -hmm. Ellsworth Kelly somewhere in between. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Carmen Herrera uh, was was extremely reductive, um, certainly in her later work. Um, but she went in the three D uh, direction. She actually made these sculptural pieces. I don't know if I'm. I'm ready to do that. I still really enjoy working on the 2D plane. Mm -hmm. They may get more reductive too, I don't know. Well, that allows too for an expansiveness. I was thinking about space and architecture, um, uh, how we experience space. And um, there is this expansiveness. I, I'm so drawn to this piece that um, um, is right in front of me, thank goodness. And um, the more I listen to you speak, the more I see this child in North Africa who has come to New Mexico. And I, I hate to reduce things to such a cliche, but those cliches have reasons for their origins. Um, I just, uh, that's what I'm seeing. Mm. Well, and certainly the, the desert has to do with uh, expansiveness and space. Mm -hmm. um, the ability to see for hundreds of miles um, is something we don't, um, as urbanites, uh, don't get that right. much. I mean, I lived in New York City, I lived in D.C., I lived in Paris, I, and uh, so I'm, uh, I appreciate the ability to see hundreds right. of miles out. Right. And there's also something that uh, Bachelard said in the Poetics of Space, uh, which has to do with immensity. And, uh, and Georgia O'Keeffe alluded to that as well. When you get to um, a point when you're, you're looking at something that is uh, so vast, so immense, so universal, you feel at the same time very small, but, but, but also very, um, very intimate with it. Mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. There's there's a 
almost a mirroring of a maybe whatever kind of spiritual um, or you know, not in any necessarily religious way uh, meaning, but uh, there is a correlation that occurs. Um, in the sense of the sublime. In the sense of the sublime, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Any other comments? You're all so brilliant. I'm just relying on you. I have, a, actually, I brought a couple of quotes that, that I I just uh, would Please. throw out there yes. because I just, you know, when I was thinking about mm -hmm. a lot of this, um, I remember one, uh, Paul Reed, who was a member of the color school, um, and I knew him until he died a few, a couple of years ago, um, at the age of 94, but he would um, often say, he says, find and chase the right rabbit. Um, be careful not to lose yourself in dead alleys. And that takes restraint and being a good editor of your ideas. Um, and, and it's not as easy as it sounds because creative people have many, many ideas. And the question is, which one do you go with? Which one do you, which are the ones that you edit out? Um, so th that's a, a driving uh, mantra for me. And, and I wrote, actually this is my interpretation of it, was an artwork improves in direct ratio to the number of elements we leave out that do not do useful work. Mm -hmm. um, and um, let's see, and then this, I, I don't know who wrote this, I just copied it. Um, it says, fight any tendency towards the stable, the durable, the definitive, everything that increases the state of dependency, apathy, passivity linked to habits, to establish criteria, to myths, and other mental structures arising from a conditioning and complicity with the structures in power. Wow. Um, and uh, there's something about the uh, the Mahdi artists who uh, that, that, that this relates to because they often spoke about the asphyxiation mm -hmm. of conventions mm -hmm. and the importance of going to uh, play mm -hmm. uh, as a way of subverting that. Mm -hmm. oh. That's a little bit Dada. <laughs> yeah. It always comes back to Dada. It does. It seems to. Yes. And Dada. the relationship between the work of art and the and the viewer. Yeah. And then of course perception. Um, and that loop is always open. Yeah. It seems. Yeah, it has to be. Yeah, it's an evolving spiral. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Anyone else? Any other thoughts from you, Mocha? Um I would just say um, that as artists, we, we need to keep trusting the, that we're going into uh, uncharted terrain and mm -hmm. that it's, that's where we want to be. And that's your job. Yeah. Yeah. And we need to trust that it's, uh, it, it will always yield some kind of fruitful material. How long have you been practicing? Really? <laughs> well, <laughs> more or less. About, uh, I 30 years. Yeah. 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 So that has a lot to do with um, figuring out which rabbits to continue chasing, mm -hmm. when to, to uh, let the ego, let that rabbit go. That rabbit's not going to do anything mm -hmm. for you, no matter how cute you may think it is. Um, yeah. Yeah. Learning when to stop. Yeah. Learning when to keep going. Mm -hmm. And how on earth to start. Well, that again, have a good library of ideas mm -hmm. and, uh, and know where to go when you need them. Uh, Gina, if you've been working a long time, I think that uh, they're there. Mm -hmm. It's a rich library it's that so you're rich. mining, and we really appreciate that. Uh, Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you.